it's been a long time ago that I realized that I just couldn't believe that we humans are not capable of organizing our economic activities in a far better way than is done by markets and private enterprise, or that was done by the very clumsy authoritarian command planning that was attempted for so many decades in so many countries. It just seemed to me unimaginable that we were really so, as a species, could we possibly be so hopelessly socially challenged that we could not manage to arrange a sensible system of equitable cooperation amongst ourselves? Were we really just, were we, were we so hopeless, hope, hopelessly socially challenged that we needed to simply engage in the economics of competition and greed? Or, ec or decision-making procedures that are basically the traditional military command approach to to making decisions about what has to be done. Could we really possibly be that socially hopeless? And I just refused to believe that we were. I mean, I saw <clears throat> in my life experience, you see people engaging with one another in sensible ways all the time. How could we run our economies in ways that, that didn't take advantage of that, that potential that we constantly show in our, in our individual interactions? So that's where this came from for me. Um, and I still think and I still believe and what has happened for me over the past three or four decades is I've become increasingly convinced of two things. The people who tell us that they're competent and know how to run things and that the way they're running things are working are more and more clearly, obviously, just blowing smoke. You don't have to run things perfectly to do better than what they're doing. So one of the things that's very important, I think, to remember is, you know, look at the, all you got to do is beat the competition, and the competition is looking really bad. And the competition in sort of centrally planned authoritarian alternatives to capitalism finally looked really bad. And the economics of competition and greed is once again looking really, really bad. Um, so we don't have to set our, we don't have to set a bar, you know, that is, that is perfection and say, well, if, if, we can't, if we can't imagine human beings making their own decisions about their own economic lives, if we can't imagine that, you know, will they make mistakes? Will we make mistakes? Of course we'll make mistakes. We'll make mistakes all the time. But that doesn't mean that it won't be far better if we are making our decisions about how we want our economies to operate, that it won't be, that our performance will far surpass the performance of the elites that are running the economies of the world these days. Anyway, to the point. So we're going to be talking about one sort of concrete set of ideas. And that's and let me let, let, let me let me say a word on that subject also. What's one of the things that's different about this this whole model of participatory economics is it's a very self-conscious attempt to go much deeper than level, levels of generality. That instead of sort of some vague and ambiguous descriptive words that say this is how we wish we would do things, it's an attempt to be much more concrete and say, you know, if you're going to run an economy, there are certain decisions that have to be made. And you need to think very clearly about how would you suggest would be a more sensible way to make each of the kinds of decisions that absolutely have to be made by somebody in some sort of way through some sort of process? Um, we felt that one of the weaknesses of those who were ready to abandon capitalism and urge others to do likewise, be willing to do likewise, was that <coughs> we as a whole had not really responded concretely and said, well, here is a very concrete set of proposals. Now, that, that led to accusations, oh, well, you're laying out a blueprint that you're saying everybody would have to follow if they set up some 
society, some post-capitalist society, you're dictating, you're almost being totalitarian, you're dictating that things have to be done exactly this way. That was never the intent. Once any group of people have abandoned capitalism or setting up something different, they're not going to listen to what Robin Hanel or Michael Albert told them they had to do. We never were intending to tell them something like that. But that's different from, well, don't we need to think rather clearly about options in advance? Isn't advanced thinking about this bound to be helpful? Um, so that's the sense in which we were sort of engaging in a process where you're going to see that there's a lot more detail to our programmatic suggestion about how things can be done. That was very much on purpose because it was a response to our sense that if you're not concrete, then it's hard to convince people that you actually have answers. And it's also hard for anybody to engage with the, the idea. I think it's very important to offer people a concrete proposal, in part precisely so that they can see what they might disagree with. If it's all vague and generality and words that all of us, you know, and it's, it's words that nobody can disagree with, then it's very hard for people to even know what it is that they might disagree with when things actually get to the point where things have to be decided. Okay. <clears throat> Another way to think about it is it was an answer to a question that the world's greatest 20th century economist once asked. And I think this is, I mean, this is something that was being asked by the world's greatest economists back in the 1930s during the last great economic crisis of capitalism. And he said, no, it's cl more clear every day that this system we have is not, it's not doing the kinds of things that we would like to have. But as he said, but when we, in his case the royal we, wonder what to put in its place, we are extremely perplexed. So in some sense, we're trying to offer an answer to what that thing might be so that Lord Keynes wouldn't be quite so perplexed, or at least he'd have something concrete to consider. We always believe that if you're trying to think through something, that the first step in the process should be, well, what are the goals you have for your economy? What is it you want your economy to do? How can you decide whether doing things this way or that way is a good or a bad idea until you know clearly how you're going to judge the outcomes? So he said, well, first and foremost, we think people should, that decisions should be made so that people have decision-making power or input in proportion to the degree that they are affected by the outcomes. Now, this is usually just called economic democracy. The, the, the most general term for this is economic democracy. And it's sort of contrasted with political democracy. Um, but you can take the general idea that people should have decision-making control over their economic lives, the things, the decisions that affect them, the economic decisions, and you can define that very differently. And we think it's very important that this be distinguished from a much more common definition of economic democracy as economic freedom. And Milton Friedman did a wonderful job of sort of defining this goal in a way that we think already confuses matters considerably. Milton Friedman defines economic freedom as the freedom to do with your person and property whatever you should choose. And it's really important to think about the difference between that way of defining this notion of economic democracy and this way of defining it. Because if you start in those two different, if, if you start in one of those, you, in, that, in, in one way or another, you'll come to very different conclusions about what it, how it is that one should go about achieving this goal. And the real problem with the standard conservative, pro-capitalist, Milton Friedman-esque way of talking about something that everybody should agree on, 
We need more economic democracy. The idea that people should, have, should, should control their own economic destinies, who could disagree with that? Well, if you define that as the freedom to do what you wish whenever you wish with your person and property, it turns out that particularly in modern economies, the more we advanced, the more that the world is full. And it turns out that when one person exercises their economic freedom, they are automatically violating the economic freedom of somebody else. You can't maximize everybody's economic freedom because they conflict. Oh, but you could always, and, and, and I'll make this point right now, we are not claiming that the system we have devised would perfectly apportion economic decision making precisely in proportion to the degree that everybody is affected by every decision. That would be very, very difficult. But you at least could always attempt to move in that direction. You at least have a coherent goal. You at least have a goal which is coherent, and that is you could always move in the direction of changing the way some decisions are made so that they more closely approximated just how much was I affected as compared to somebody else. And, and, and the reason that this is important is if you, if you step back half a step and look at economic decisions, what you realize is most economic decisions do not affect one person only. They affect more than one person. And most economic decisions do not affect all of us equally. There are some economic decisions that more or less do, do affect all of us equally. But most economic decisions affect some people more than others. They affect more than one. They affect a group of people, but disproportionately. Some of the people in that group are affected to a much greater degree, and some are affected to a much lesser degree. And thinking clearly about that when you're designing how to make decisions, I think, is, is very important to keep in mind. For instance, have a group. We're gonna, in a minute, we're going to have workers' councils. And I'm going to say that the workers' councils are sovereign just over deciding what they produce and how they go about it. Well, people in a workers' councils, what they produce and how they go about it affects them more than others. But those decisions also affect others. So you need to design a decision-making system that allows them more say and more input over those decisions, but allows other people who are affected to also weigh in and have an appropriate degree of control or influence over those decisions. In any case, that's self-management. Justice. <clears throat> Until you've decided what you think economic justice is, it's very difficult to figure out, or I would say, simply impossible to decide, well, how should we organize the economy? And there's competing notions of what economic justice is. Milton Friedman defines economic justice as reward according to the value of the contribution of your labor and whatever productive property you happen to own, including shares of stock, gives you ownership over a lot of machines. And if having those machines allows us to produce more goods and services and you're the owner, well, then you deserve to get the contribution to output that comes from the fact that those machines exist. Now, most socialists rejected that idea a long time ago because it we clearly recognized what, what Michael and I have been writing about and talking about for a long time called the, the Rockefeller grandson problem. If that's your notion of economic justice, what's fair is everybody gets, <clears throat> according to the value of their own labor and the productive property they own, well, that implies that the grandson of a Rockefeller has a right to consume a 1,000 times more than somebody out there working as a medical doctor or, or, or picking up garbage in the streets all day. And that's sort of the essence of what is not fair I mean, for, for most socialists and many people who don't think of themselves as socialists, that's precisely what they think. That's the, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. That's the, un well, you could then solve the Rockefeller grandson problem by saying, oh, and 
many socialists, and I think this is essentially what market socialists have done, they say, well, clearly that's not fair. The problem is what's just is not according to the contribution of your labor and your property. It should just be according to the contribution of your labor. Otherwise, we're going to give consumption rights and say it's unfair for the Rockefeller heir who never works a day in his life to consume far more than the rest of us. Well, I think that's equally problem. It's not equally problematic, but it's also logically just as problematic. And <clears throat> the way we've tried to sort of hone in on what's the problem with that approach to economic justice is point out you could have a doctor who benefited from decades of education at public expense in certain economies, who's a talented person, has a lot of education, and if you take a look at the contribution of that doctor in terms of how much well-being does that doctor's labor provide, and you compare it to, well, how much well-being does the labor of somebody who's working, picking up garbage 40, 50 hours a week starting at 3 in the morning in the drizzle and the rain, if that's your notion of what's fair, then you're going to have to compensate that doctor 10, 15, 20 times more than the person who's carrying out the socially necessary labor of making sure that we don't have streets that are running over with garbage. So if that strikes you as unfair also, well, then that also fails as you know, a way that you can... That fails as a conception of economic justice, and therefore you don't want to design an economy that would produce that outcome because you will decide that the outcome you know, is not one that you consider to be fair or equitable. So our suggestion is, look, contribution, <clears throat> that economic justice is reward or compensation or pay or income, whatever word you want to use, that is based upon effort or sacrifice. If everybody sacrifice to the same degree when they're carrying out whatever their tasks are in the economy, then everybody would deserve to benefit equally. But if it just doesn't happen to be true that everybody is sacrificing to, a greater, to, to the same degree, and quite frankly, I don't think we really even need to require that that be the case. Why shouldn't some people be free to decide, I actually don't want to work as many hours as long as they're willing to then say, and therefore I am willing to consume less than people who do work more hours, there's nothing wrong with that. So <clears throat> there's no reason not to, there's no reason to discourage people from choosing the degree to which they engage in sacrifices and, and, and the efforts they put in and work. And then, but once people have gone ahead and chosen with regard to that, and that's something that, pe and, and that's a key point, that's something people do have power to control. I can't control how brilliant I am. I can't control, I can't control the fact that, you know, I don't have a left foot that can do what, what Messi's left foot can do. On the other hand, I can control whether I work hard. I can control whether I go ahead and work extra hours or don't work extra hours. Those are things that we have control over, or we at least have a lot more control over than we do over some other things. So people do have control over that. And so <clears throat> when we sat down to think about what are the goals of the economy, we said, well, economic justice would be compensation or reward according to efforts and sacrifices. If there are differences in efforts and sacrifices, what would be fair would be to recognize them with commensurate differences in, in benefit. If you incur greater costs than others do in the social endeavor, then and only then do you deserve to have greater benefits. Solidarity. You can organize an economy in a way that will undermine human solidarity. That's exactly what markets and private enterprise do, as a matter of fact. One of the unmentioned liabilities of the economics and competition and greed is, I think it's, I mean, it, it should be apparent to us from now, you know, by this point, that humans have, capab humans have the capability to engage with one another in a solidaritous way. 
What do I mean by solidarity? Have empathy for others. Have concern for the well-being of others. Um, grant others sort of the same right to pursue their own well-being as you want them to grant you. All of that is simply what I call solidarity. Solidarity is actually a word that, that's an old left word. It's been with the left for a long, long time. Um, it's not one, it, and it tends to be a word that non-leftists don't use and find unfamiliar. So that's why I'm substituting some other things that are empathy, having empathy for others, concern for the well-being of others. That's what the left has always meant by solidarity. Um, well, what if it turns out that if you organize decision-making in a certain kind of way, it undermines solidarity between groups of human beings? And if you, were, if you would just organize it in a different way, it would not do that. It might even encourage greater levels of solidarity. It clearly seems that both in the world today and in any future world I can imagine, setting things up so that we encourage solidarity rather than undermine solidarity is clearly the best thing for the human species going forward. We have plenty of, we, we have, we have plenty of ability to engage in non-solidaritous behavior regarding one another. We don't need to be encouraging that. It would be far better to encourage this other side of our potential. Diversity. People are very different. The best life for some people is very different from the best life for somebody else. So you don't want an economy that basically fails to offer a diversity of life experiences, lifestyles, life choices, etc. There's no reason that the economy should discourage that. Um, I'm going to come to efficiency last and do sustainability now. And, and I'll make a, a big confession. Um, <clears throat> when I first started thinking about this, I first started writing about this, I was terribly under self-educated on environmental issues. Now, I don't feel that that's so much the case in my, it, it, that, that's not my situation anymore. Um, for the past more than 15 years that I was teaching, I was teaching environmental economics and have done a thorough job of re-educating myself on the subject. So while I'm admitting that I was undereducated on environmental issues and sustainability issues for a long part of my career, um, I'll also say I think when the shoe fits, other people should be willing to wear it. The left as a whole has been very slow to come to environmental awareness. Environmentalists, if you, I mean, the environmentalists know who was hardest to wake up, and they know that the left was not necessarily so easy to wake up on that subject as some other constituencies were. So we all, in some sense, are Johnny-come-latelys to environmental consciousness. But it's important for us to strive in that area. Sustainability basically is about protecting and nurturing the natural environment. And clearly we now know that any economy that does not accomplish that um, is terribly, it, it is completely unacceptable. We are rapidly leading, we, we live in such an economy, that economy is very rapidly within a 10 year process likely create an environmental situation that that is literally, literally a crisis that humanity has never faced before. So you don't want to have an economy that is failing abysmally in this regard. Um, finally, efficiency. <laughs> if you're an economist, you talk about efficiency all the time. You, can't talk, you almost can't talk about anything else. You want to talk with economists, you really can't talk about anything else except efficiency. That's part of the problem with economists. On the other hand, the left and many people in the mainstream are so aware of how economists fetishize this notion of efficiency and turn it to the be-all, the end-all. There's a tremendous tendency to just say, well, that's what they talk about. That's what the capitalists and the mainstream economists talk about. They talk about efficiency. There's no reason for us to care about efficiency. And I think that's a mistake because efficiency does matter. 
when you properly define what efficiency is. Efficiency would be taking scarce productive resources and using them in a way that you're wasting them. Efficiency would, as long as we have work that people would rather not do, they'd rather be in leisure, why wouldn't people resent an economy that wastes work? I had to work longer hours than I should have had to because we could have actually done with less work and we could have had more leisure. As long as you're careful about how you define efficiency, I don't want to throw that goal out. I don't want to say, I'm not going to judge my economy. I'm not going to even look to see whether or not it's, 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 it's allocating scarce productive resources efficiently. I'm not going to even look to see whether it's making us all work longer than we have to. So that's all I mean by efficiency, and I do think it's something that needs to be taken into account.